Welcome ladies and gents, Crystal Andre here. You can find me at Bet Boxing on Twitter, or of course you can subscribe to the channel, Let's Talk Boxing. This video is dedicated to all of those people out there who followed the channel and were always so complimentary. You always used to say how unbiased I was, how I would offer fair arguments from both sides of the aisle, and I would let the public be the jury. I would be the defense and the prosecution. And you said you loved it until I took a position against a specific fighter that you are passionate about and that led to you losing your minds and you came at me you called me biased you said that I was a fanboy of another fighter and so on and so forth instead of just accepting the fact that I had a different view and you could have politely disagreed I had one character that was saying to me if you were a real man and he was questioning whether I'm a real man and then when I called him a fanboy in yesterday's video he turned around and accused me of having an ego my friend when i'm sitting here and i'm engaging with everybody even those that disagree with me and we are all polite and we all have banter but you get so upset you start questioning whether someone's a real man and he calls you a fanboy don't get offended there's a reason you reacted like that because you're up in your feelings so this is dedicated to people like you so let's get into this because the plot has thickened ladies and gents Alexander Usyk has signed for the Saudi promotional company Skills Challenge. Why has he done this? Well, according to Alexander Usyk, his motive is that it's a great opportunity to bring the biggest fight in heavyweight history to the boxing fans of the whole world. Tyson Fury doesn't want the fight, but we will make it happen. So apparently, the reason that Alexander Usyk has decided to sign for Skills Challenge is in order to make the fight happen. Prior to this, they were just a broker, right? Whereas now, they are the promoter of one specific fighter rather than the other. That adds an additional obstacle, but that's not why I'm making this particular video. You see, from the beginning of the negotiations, I've been very critical of Tyson Fury. I've been saying from the beginning, this guy does not want to fight Alexander Usyk. Now, I don't know why. Is it because he's afraid of Usyk? He feels he's going to lose? Or is it because, as Alan Babich says, he's carrying a whole host of injuries? His body's breaking down. And he was stalling to buy time, healing time, so that when he does fight Alexander Usyk, he can be at his absolute best. I can't possibly know what his real motivations are. But I have never deviated from criticizing Tyson Fury. However... 90% of the way, I've been saying that Alexander Usyk is doing his utmost to make the fight happen. He's jumping through hoops. However, in that final hurdle when he had Tyson Fury pinned with nowhere else to go, he made a demand of 70-30 for the rematch in his favor, something that was unprecedented, unrealistic, and was not conducive to making the fight. And when I said this, I had people insulting me, despite the fact that even the arch nemesis of Tyson Fury, Eddie Hearn, gave my exact arguments in a subsequent video on IFL TV, and you can see it on your screen now, you can go check it out yourselves. Every point I made, he reinforced, but you still went down the route of calling me a fanboy. Well, let's consider now what this potentially means. You see, up until this point, I had assumed that the reason Alexander Usyk walked away from negotiations 24 hours after making that demand that was never going to be met was because of pride. He'd had enough of Tyson Fury's absolute rubbish, but now there's a potential different motive from just pride. Dev Sani put out a tweet to say, if Usyk had lost to Tyson Fury at Wembley Stadium on April the 29th, having accepted 30% of the pot, there would be no Saudi deal for him. This whole rematch clause stuff was just a get out. It's understandable he walked away from a UK fight with a view to revisit the Fury fight later on for more money with Saudi backing. Hopefully fans can stop pretending that Fury ducked Usyk now. It was a business decision from Usyk to not fight in April. Fury was ready to go. Now we know that Dev Sani is a Queensbury man, but you can't just dismiss him because of that. You need to focus on the argument at hand. So if I'm going to do that, I'm going to say there's a lot here that I disagree with when it comes to Dev Sani's position. No, there isn't evidence that Fury was ready to go as far as I'm concerned. And also, the reason this was happening at Wembley Stadium rather than Saudi Arabia is because Tyson Fury reportedly turned down the big offers coming from the Saudis. So we can't absolve Tyson Fury of any responsibility here. If, for argument's sake, his team had said to him, Yo, Alexander, the Saudis have just come in with a massive offer. It would be far too risky to fight Tyson Fury at Wembley for 30%. 
How about we make this unrealistic offer, knowing they'll turn it down. You can then walk away. We'll tell the world, look at the way Tyson Fury has conducted himself. And we'll take this massive offer from the Saudis. It's a no-brainer. Now, if that cynical example was to apply, then it would make sense, right? Now, I know a lot of you don't want to believe these things because after all, Alexander Rusik in January, he put out a tweet to say, I'm ready to box you even without any prize money. But when Fury says things like that, I'm going to fight Anthony Joshua for free for the fans. And clearly he's very greedy and very money minded. You guys want to be critical of Tyson Fury for that and rightly so. But when it comes to Alexander Usyk making those comments, well, that's a different matter, right? After all, Alexander Usyk has samurai-like values. I mean, this is a guy who wouldn't ever be concerned about money. He's all about legacy, right? This is not a guy who asked for 93% split in order to fight Joe Joyce. This is not a man who is now signing this deal because it reportedly makes him the biggest earner in boxing. Of course not. Alexander Usyk's not that guy. When Anthony Joshua was offering him a measly contract initially, he's not the guy that was demanding more money from Eddie Hearn. Nah, that was just jokes. He's not concerned about money. Well, let's consider, though, some of the stuff that's been said, because, Chris, how do you know that they didn't just approach Alexander Usyk this week? Why do you think that he knew about this from back then? There's no evidence for that. Well, Amir Abdullah gave an interview with Boxing King Media and shout out to Boxing King Media. He always asks the right probing questions. He asked, when did the ball get rolling with Alexander Usyk? And Amir answered. Amir responded with, when we look at different names of who to sign and the strategy behind different fighters and what we could do with them, Usyk's name was always on that list. But there were some things that we had to go through, the kind of landscape and what the future would look like. Because when you have a versatile and dynamic fighter like Alexander, you have a lot of options that open up with that. So we've had our eye on, on Alexander for a while. And as soon as it got serious, it was a quick phone call. We called Alex, called Aegis. We met in London and the meeting took five minutes. We shook hands and we were on our way. When was the last time Alexander Usyk was in London? But we'll get to that later on. Now, he was always on their list, right? And just to show you, by the way, that this could potentially decrease the chances of a fight happening, I'm just digressing slightly before we come back to that point of when this took place. When he introduced Egis Klimas, he turned and he said, I turn here to my longtime friend and I try not to be biased, but arguably one of the best managers in the sport. Do you know why he said, I try not to be biased? because now there is an affiliation there from a business perspective. They are not just friends anymore, ladies and gents. This is the promotional company of Alexander Usyk. They are representing Alexander Usyk. The best interests of Alexander Usyk are in line with the best interests of Skills Challenge. So Tyson Fury can look at this now and say, you are a rival promoter. I'm not coming to Saudi Arabia on your promoter's home turf. You're gonna come to the UK, to Wembley, on my turf. I'm the A-side. Now, this adds another obstacle, does it not? But let's not dwell too much on that and let's get back to Egis Klimas and his comments. Because Boxing King Media once again asked, explain how this deal came about and when it initially started. And Egis Klimas said, we've already been here to fight Joshua for the rematch and that's how we met Prince Khalid. And we were welcomed warmly here. And Amir, who's a good friend of mine, began helping Prince Khalid and we've been talking about that. Because we saw a future big fight at the end of December, it's a no-brainer to come here and to be working with people who want to work with you. So from the moment, it seems, that Amir took a prominent role in Skills Challenge, they were talking about that. That, my friends, is motive. That can explain why Alexander Usyk was jumping through hoops to make the fight happen before he suddenly made a demand that was never going to be met. It doesn't mean he's wrong for that. You might look at this situation and say, you know what, good for him, man. Why should you always bend over? Good for you. But for all you cats out there that came at me calling me biased simply for pointing that out, you can send your apologies on a postcard. And let me just make one more little comment here as well regarding this. Michael Benson got this from ESP and Knockout. He tweeted to say, the Canelo Alvarez versus Dimitri Bivol rematch is now in doubt, as Bivol's manager, Vadim Kornilov, said. 
They don't want a rematch. A rematch cannot take place on the same terms as the fight you lost. It's stupid. We are looking forward. Artur Baturbiev is our target. Now, let's all hope Bivol Baturbiev happens and the WBC don't stand in the way because it's a fight for the ages and one we all want to see. And whilst I agree 100% with Vadim Kornilov here, that if you want a rematch and you've lost the first fight, you cannot possibly demand the same terms that you demanded the first time around. I'm wholeheartedly agreeing with that. How many of you out there now think that Dimitri Bivol demanded 70-30 in his favour? In the words of Frank Warren, do me a favour. Now, moving on from that, because Chris Andre is in the mood now, because I've been vindicated once, let's get vindicated again. For those of you that follow me on Twitter, you would have seen a couple of weeks ago, I've been having a lot of back and forths with a lot of MMA fans. You see... When it comes to mixed martial arts, people often forget what it means. It simply means that you are practicing more than one martial art. But when there was talk about John Jones fighting Tyson Fury and people were commenting about it being in the street and Joe Rogan said that if you lock them in a room, he knows which guy is going to come out alive. You had Dylan Dennis put out a tweet to say, I will bet you any money you want, basically, that in an MMA ring, there's only one winner and it will be john jones and i explained that okay i'm not arguing against that but mma in a cage is very different from a street fight in, sh in a street fight things are chaotic you've got one guy who's highly trained in one martial art and you've got another guy who's trained in numerous martial arts but they're both big men anything can happen in a chaotic situation if you try and shoot at somebody's legs and you don't get it right you're going to smash up your knees on a concrete floor the surface you're fighting on matters are there any stools around that you could potentially trip over is the floor wet uh, how big is the room you're fighting in all these different uncontrollable variables play a part in a chaotic fight in the street additionally to that you also have rules in mma there is a window of opportunity even when somebody grabs you and they're about to take you to the floor where you can do something. You can gouge an eye. You can bite. You can drop a vertical elbow onto somebody's cervical spine. You can hit them with a low blow. You can bite them. You can, you can manipulate small joints and stuff like that. There are a million things that you can do between getting grappled and taken down and then being put in a lock. And as a result of that, it's chaotic and it's not as straightforward as saying who wins in a cage wins in the street. Now, mixed martial arts just means you are practicing more than one martial art. So a lot of boxers aren't only practicing one martial art either. Terence Crawford and Vasyl Lomachenko and Alexander Usyk have wrestling backgrounds. Dillian White has a kickboxing background. Kovalev fought Sambo. These guys are trained in more than just one thing. Why are you assuming that someone who's a boxer only knows how to box? Well, you had a couple of boxers fight in an MMA cage in Poland over the last 24 hours. Krzysztof Glavatsky fought Tolkachevsky. And this guy is a bare knuckle fighter who has practiced various other martial arts. And that is what mixed martial arts is. It just means you practice more than one martial art. And he was actually the favorite, according to the bookies, to win the fight. You also had the former heavyweight contender, Artur Spilka. And he fought Pudzianowski, who was a former world's strongest man, who is a purple belt in BJJ. Let's take a look at how those fights went. Glavatsky's on the floor and with his back on the floor getting ground and pounded, he lands a shot with his back on the floor and knocks him out. Here's Arta Spilka getting grappled. He couldn't get him down, right? Then he lands a lovely little uppercut. They start exchanging hooks and it's the purple belt in BJJ that goes to sleep. This is what can happen in a fight. Now, yes, if you are a mixed martial artist, you have more tools at your disposal. If you're going to tell me an MMA fighter, has more chance of winning against a boxer because a boxer who is trained in straight boxing and nothing else has fewer tools. I'm not going to disagree with you. I agree. But don't tell me that a grappler grabbing a boxer is almost like a trained fighter grabbing a 10-year-old. When I hear these stupid comments about even a high school wrestler would destroy a world-class heavyweight boxer, behave yourselves. Anyway, enough of vindicating Chris Audre today. Shout out to those of you that have decided to get insulting. And for the dude that said that, I've got an ego because I called him a fanboy. I don't have an ego with anybody that politely disagrees with me, my friend. But when you start insulting people, don't then cry when they call you out for what you are. Let me know what you think, ladies and gents. Please don't forget to hit a stiff jab on the like button, the right cross on the subscribe button, and an uppercut on the notifications button. Take care. God bless.